Um, most of you know what bullying is. It's uh, a huge problem in schools. It's got all sorts of implications for mental health and uh, not only for the victims of bullies, but the bullies and to a lesser extent, perhaps even the so-called innocent bystanders, which are a major focus of some of the things that we're doing with the research. Here I'm going to summarize research in which we've developed stronger measures for bullying and victimization. Uh, we've related them to a whole host of student characteristics and other relevant uh, psychosocial and well-being variables. And we've devised and implemented a, a whole school anti-bullying intervention that uh, works. Okay, so in this section, I'll begin by defining what we mean by bullying and being a victim, a target of bullying, and then we describe the psychological instruments that we've developed uh, to measure these constructs. So what is bullying? Uh, it involves the intentional action designed to inflict physical and psychological harm on another person. It involves a complex interplay of dominance and social status. It incorporates a wide range of aggressive and social behaviors, as such as name calling, exhaustion, phys physical violence, uh, slander, group exclusion, damage to property, verbal intimidation. Bullying is different from aggression in that uh, whereas aggression is usually a single action, bullying is repetitive in nature. Bullies continue to bully victims for extended periods of time. Bullying also involves an imbalance of power. Uh, bullies seek uh, victims who are easy targets. These include knowledge that the bullies will be able to overcome the, uh, uh, the victims, but it also uh, means that they're choosing people typically who are vulnerable. Uh, um, historically, a major conceptual problem with bullying has uh, been that it's seen as a bipolar construct. So you're a bully or a victim and so people uh, tended to put them on a continuum and we now know that this is quite inappropriate. There's a growing body of us research from around the world that shows that bullying and victim factors are positively correlated. So based on our research the correlation is roughly 0.3. So uh, it's clearly inappropriate to uh, put them on a single continuum. It's uh, clearly the, uh, the bipolar uh, notion would suggest that the correlation is my approach is minus one. It's positive, not minus uh, negative. So it's clearly inappropriate. And this also has implications for a lot of research that tends to talk about uh, uh, categorizing people, you know, have a cut score, anybody above that is a bully, anybody below it is, and, and so forth. So there's, so there's some real problems with that, and so uh, we, uh, we tackled the issue of measuring bully uh, to begin with. Okay, so based on the literature, we differentiated uh, bullying into physical, verbal, and social factors. There's a clear rationale for this, but this typology, but there uh, were very few, there were no instruments that were able to adequately differentiate between these. Uh, the, at least not in terms of uh, psychometrically defensible uh, measures. So the literature further noted the need to assess bully and victim domains simultaneously to better understand the complex uh, relations between these domains and subdomains at a single point in time and over time. So uh, an important aspect is, is that for many of the things that we're looking at, it's important to have both uh, the bully scales and the victim scales in the same model because, uh, because they're related to each other. Uh, so we proposed uh, three bully scales, physical, verbal, and social relational, and, th and three parallel victim scales, uh, and developed instruments to measure this. Uh, let's see. So here uh, we've got some some basic uh, psychometric information. The uh, instrument that was part of Roberto Parada's uh, PhD thesis uh, is called the Adolescent Peer Relations Instrument, or APRI, uh, and we were able to identify the six different factors. So there was reasonable support for the a priori uh, factor structure. Uh, 
because the factors, uh, the bully factors tended to be highly correlated and the victim factors tended to be highly correlated, uh, uh, the early research that we did here was one of the first applications of exploratory structural equation modeling. And so many of you have heard about it, uh, are talking about this as a methodological uh, uh, approach that's sort of the best features of confirmatory factor analysis and exploratory factor analysis. And that was central in the work uh, in developing and validating the instruments here. <laughs> The development of strong instruments to measure multiple dimensions of bully and victim are likely to be one of the more important aspects coming out of uh, this paper because there's just a, a very, the measurement area in, that er in this area is fairly poor. We begin by evaluating relations between bully and victim scores and student demographic variables, particularly <coughs> gender and age. Do boys have higher scores or does it depend on the subdomain? And during high school years, do bullying and victims, uh, uh, do the, the incidents change? So let's start with gender differences. For both bully and victim scores, uh, domains, girls have much lower physical uh, and uh, physical bullying and victim scores, moderately lower verbal and victim scores, and not a whole lot of difference in terms of the uh, social bullying and victim scores. So in summary, boys have higher bullying and victim scores than girls overall, but uh, there's some big differences in types of bullying. Here we have some uh, looking at uh, gender by age uh, interactions. The age differences are a bit more complicated. The age has linear and nonlinear relations with the bully victim factors. For all six factors, scores tended to be lowest in year seven, increased to year eight, remain reasonably stable in years nine and 10, and decline a little bit in year 11. However, the pattern varied depending on the uh, bully victim factors. The increases in age were stronger for the bully factors than the victim factors. To understand these differences, it's important to recognize that bully and victim factors are positively related. Those uh, with higher bully scores tended to also have higher victim scores and vice versa. As students who are high on bully and victim factors grow older, it's easier for bullies to target younger victims, and it's harder, uh, and there's fewer older bullies uh, to target them. Hence, uh, bully factors increase with age to a greater extent than victim factors. We also looked at the age-gender interaction for each of the bully and victim factors, but these tended to be pretty small. Gender differences were reasonably similar over ages. Age differences were reasonably similar over gender. There were, however, uh, gender differences tended to be a little bit smaller in the younger students. Okay, now we consider uh, how they're related to a wide variety of uh, psychosocial and well-being uh, indicators of mental health. Uh, so what we're looking at is what do the uh, patterns of results support the construct validity of the bully and victim factors and also gaining insight uh, into uh, the nature of these uh, these of these constructs and hopefully uh, giving some insight into what we need to do to, uh, for interventions as well. Okay, so uh, we were looking at, uh, at attitudes toward bullying and victim. Uh, we measure pro-bully attitudes and pro-victim attitudes. Unlike the bully and victim factors, pro-bully bully and pro-victim factors are substantially negatively correlated. The negative correlation is around 0.5. The pattern of relations generally supported our expectations, but there are also a few surprises. Uh, not surprisingly, bullying was uh, strongly related to endorsing pro-bully attitudes and negatively related to pro-victim attitudes. More surprising, however, victim scores had a similar, although weaker, pattern of relations. The victim's uh, factors were weakly but positively related to uh, pro-bully attitudes and were nearly unrelated to pro-victim attitudes. The lack of pro-victim attitudes by victims suggests that the negative feelings that victims have for themselves, 
Victims seem to identify with bullies more uh, than they do other victims. So here, bullies and victims are surprisingly similar. And we'll find this pattern in a number of these uh, uh, different constructs that uh, the victims are really, in many respects, their profile of relations with different variables are more like bullies uh, and, and not very sympathetic to them, to their own situation. So next we looked at how people respond when witnessing a bully uh, uh, situation. So they can actively or, re uh, or passively reinforce the bully, they can ignore the situation, or they can act, uh, actively uh, advocate for the victim. Uh, bullies were substantially more likely to reinforce uh, the bullying activity to actively and passively encourage bullying behaviors. That's not too surprising. In contrast, bullies were less likely to, uh, were less likely to ignore the situation and more likely, uh, uh, particularly less likely to advocate for the victim. Again, that's not too surprising. Uh, what was surprising is that uh, the somewhat positively correlated between taking a role of an active or a passive reinforcer of bullies. So victims uh, uh, tended to advocate for the bully uh, taking either a, uh, an active or a passive role in the bullying. So the victims uh, didn't stand up uh, or advocate for the other victims. But uh, the victims were essentially unrelated to ignoring or disregarding the situation or actively ad advocating for the victim. Hence, victims were more likely to be active or passive reinforcers of the bully. Okay, uh, now we're looking at three coping styles, uh, how students cope with a problem or a stressful situation, avoidance, problem solving, or seeking support. Uh, these measures weren't particular were not specific to the bullying situation. So these were general strategies that people use uh, for coping. Bullies were more likely to use avoidant coping strategies and less likely uh, to use problem solving or seeking social support. Victims were even more likely to use avoidance than bullies. Whereas the bully factors were negatively correlated with problem solving and seeking social support factors, the victim factors were nearly unrelated to these coping styles. Bullies and victims tended to be surprisingly similar uh, in relation to these coping styles. Uh, next variable that we looked at was locus of control. So uh, we had separate internal and external locus of control scales. Uh, the uh, external locus of control was positively related to both bully and particularly uh, victim factors, so people tended to externalize issues. Internal uh, locus of control tended to be negatively related to both bully and victim factors. The pattern of high external and low internal scores is not surprising for the victim factors, but it was somewhat unexpected uh, for the bully factors. This suggests that bullying behaviors may represent attempts to regain control over an environment uh, that's perceived as uncontrollable. The results also support the proposal that victims and bullies are uh, surprisingly similar to each other. Next, we looked at anger expression. Uh, uh, how do students cope with anger? They control it, they internalize it or externalize it. Those are the three scales. Both the bully, uh, bullies and victims uh, have difficulties in controlling their anger, particularly if it's uh, to verbal or physical bullying and victimization, respectively. Uh, however, a clear pattern emerges in which bullies are more likely to deal with anger by external means, where victims are more likely to internalize their angry feelings. So at least in this scale, there were clear differences between, the, the pattern was different between bullies and victims. Next, we're looking at depression. Um, there's a substantial body that attests to the negative correlations between uh, victim and depression. Our results, however, indicate that both bullies and victims uh, reported some uh, depressed effect, although victims to a much greater extent. Uh, here, I've, I, I've skipped ahead. 
Yeah, okay. So here we're looking at uh, the non-academic areas of, of uh, self-concept. Previous research suggested that uh, there's clear uh, pattern of expectations for bully factors. Although most of these correlations were negative, some were close to zero, and the two physical scales uh, and the two social scales uh, were close to zero. So uh, bullies tend to have uh, lower self-concepts in most areas, but not necessarily in terms of the physical areas and the social and emotional stability areas. Interestingly, however, global self-esteem is negative for both bully and victim factors, and the sizes of these negative correlations are reasonably similar. Hence, neither bullies nor victims have particularly good self-concepts. Despite the generally negative correlations for both bully and victim factors, there's some clear distinctions. The bully factors are positively correlated with opposite sex relations, uh, self-concepts. So bullies perceive themselves as being uh, popular with the opposite sex. Now this is their self-perceptions rather than uh, what uh, the opposite sex actually feels. For bullies, the most negative differences are for the honesty, trustworthiness scale, and for the parent scale. This suggests that bullies know that uh, what they're doing isn't the right thing, and this is important in terms of potential intervention. For victims, the most negative areas of self-concept are same-sex relationships. This probably reflects the fact that bullying is typically done uh, by uh, same-sex peers. Victims fare worse than bullies in terms of emotional stability self-concept, which is consistent with the finding on depression. In summary, both bullies and victims have self-concepts that are below average in most areas. Again, there are qualitative differences between bullies and victims. Nevertheless, the results suggest that there's a similar pattern of results in many respects. Now let's look at the academic components. Both bullies and victims tended to have depressed academic self-concepts. The effects are larger for the uh, general academic uh, factor uh, than specific math and verbal factors. This probably reflects the fact that there's a more general adjustment factor uh, in the school scale than there, there, there are in the specific scale. Bullies tend to have uh, more negative scores than victims. So in, port of, in support of the construct validity of the scales, we examine the patterns in relation to a wide variety of psychosocial uh, constructs. Although there were qualitative differences between the two, the results suggest that there are many similarities between bullies and victims. And there were a number of surprising results. As expected, bullies were positively related to pro-bully attitudes and negatively related to pro-victim attitudes. Surprisingly, however, victim scores were also positively related to pro-bully attitudes and not higher pro-victim <laughs> attitudes. So the victims clearly aren't identifying with being victims and uh, they don't have positive or uh, uh, supportive attitudes toward other victims. Bullies and victims are clearly alike, more alike than they are different. Okay. Um, however, there are some striking differences between bullies and victims. Uh, their uh, bully and victim scores are negatively related to effective ma uh, anger management. Bullying was related to externalizing anger, whereas victims were uh, tended to internalize anger. Although the uh, bullies and victim scores were positively related to depression and negatively related to self-esteem, there were some clear differences in the pattern with several specific components of self-concept. Um, <coughs> but the complex pattern of relations between bully victim factors and this diverse set of correlates supported both the convergent and divergent validity of the bully and victim scales in relation to uh, both the broad domains, bully and victim, but also the subdomain, verbal, social, and physical. Thus far, we've looked at cross-sectional data uh, from a single point of time. Now we move to more complex analysis of the longitudinal data. Uh, we hypothesize that bullying and victimization are mutually reinforcing and uh, positively, as well as being positively related, that bullies become victims and that uh, prior victims become bullies. Uh, 
Appropriate tests for these require complex longitudinal analysis, but it's an important issue with practical implications. For example, it may explain why bullies and victims uh, factors are positively correlated. It also has some interesting implications for intervention. Testing uh, uh, causal hypothesis, causal ordering hypothesis of this type requires at minimum longitudinal models with the same constructs measured on multiple occasions. Of particular interest, we ask, do today's bully become victims in the future, the red lines, uh, and do victims become uh, bullies, the blue lines? The bully and victim uh, factors are reasonably stable over time. The test-retest correlations are about 0.7 for both. However, the total effects of time one bully on time two and three victim scores are positive, and the total effects of time one victim scores on time two and three bu uh, bully scores are positive. This indicates that there's a pattern of reciprocal effects in which prior bullying leads to subsequently being a victim and being a victim uh, leads to subsequently being a bully. However, the tendency is stronger for bullying leading to victim than vice versa. In summary, bullies, and victim, bullies become victims and victims become bullies. Um, our results show that bullies and victims are positively correlated. Bullies and victims are similar uh, in a whole variety of different ways. Our reciprocal effect model shows that being a bully leads to being a victim, and being a victim leads to being a bully. Indeed, many bullies are also victims, and many victims are also bullies. So the majority of students are not bullies or, or victims. Whilst uh, we haven't focused on these uh, innocent, so-called innocent bystanders, it's our supposition that they're not so innocent. Indeed, there's critical, uh, they are critical in the, uh, establishing the social ethos of the school that supports a bullying culture. Some of the more recent work that we've looked at is looking at the role of depression and self-concept as risk factors or uh, consequences. So uh, here we're asking the question, uh, we're, the, we're extending the causal ordering to include the 11 self-concept scales. Again, we're struck by the similarities and results between the bullies and victims. Both bullies and victims factors at time one typically lead to lower self-concepts. Whereas these negative consequences are somewhat larger and more consistent for victims than bullies, the overall pattern was similar. <coughs> However, higher levels of self-concept at time one typically resulted in lower levels of subsequent bullying and victim scores, even after controlling for prior victim and bully scores. Thus, low self-concepts are a risk factor of being a bully or a victim. This pattern was evident for both the bullies and victors, victims, although somewhat stronger for the victims. Physical self-concept was an exception. Higher physical self-concepts at time one led to subsequent, somewhat higher subsequent bully victim scores. The results for parental relations and honesty, trustworthiness, self-concepts were particularly noteworthy. Good relations with parents and good moral values led to significant reductions in bully and victim scores. Furthermore, being a bully led to reduced levels of parent uh, relations and honesty, trustworthiness. This pattern of results suggests that good parental relations and good moral values are antithetical to both uh, bullying and victim and being a victim. Hence, interventions designed to counter the negative consequences need to involve parents and emphasize good moral values. <coughs> More recently, we've been looking, I've been looking at some causal ordering of depression, bullying, and victims. The answers to these fundamental questions have important implications for theory, policy, practice, uh, but there's limited res good research that's looking, uh, that's based on uh, fully latent reciprocal effect models. So we address these issues with a longitudinal study with responses from high school students, three, almost 4,000 students, who completed the same psychometric strong multi-item uh, instrument six times over a two-year period of time. There's a substantial amount of cross-sectional research that shows that these variables are positively correlated, but little research uh, that's actually looking at the causal ordering of these variables. <coughs> Here I've just 
summarize some of the models that I looked at. Uh, the CFA models, uh, I won't go into the psychometrics of this, but particularly with the longitudinal models, it's important to include correlated uniquenesses, and this can only be done if you start off at the item level. Uh, we showed that the uh, factor loading invariance was invariant over time, over the waves, and uh, uh, the inclusion of gender year and gender by year interaction had relatively little impact. Uh, for the structural equation models, we looked at lag one paths uh, from all the variables, but we also, for the stability uh, paths, uh, we looked at all the different lags. We included all the different lags, and we showed that these, uh, these paths were reasonably invariant over time, uh, which, we've ref which Phil, I think, dubs the expression uh, developmental equilibrium, uh, which I've... Uh, did you develop that, or did you, pull, did you find somebody else? I think it was Alex, but I'm willing to take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alex isn't here yes. now, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the uh, diagram. Uh, consistently across the multiple waves, there were reciprocal effects between bully and victim scores. Uh, we've already known that one, so that's not surprising. Each had a positive predictive effect on the other, such that bullies became victims and victims became bullies. However, uh, whereas depression had a positive predictive effect on subsequent victim factors, victim factors had no effect on subsequent depression after controlling for prior outcomes. The effect was unidimensional, so that depression leads to being a bully, but be, uh, being a victim, but being a victim doesn't lead to enhanced depression above and beyond the earlier depression. And this is really quite interesting and uh, important finding, because it suggests that uh, depression is a risk factor. <laughs> it suggests uh, it's consistent with research that suggests that bullies find people that are, uh, target people that are vulnerable, and that one of these sources of vulnerability is depression. But it was quite interesting that it's a unidirectional effect in that the effect is from depression to, uh, depression leading to being a victim, but uh, being a victim doesn't lead to further depression above and beyond previous depression. Also, it's interesting that there were no reciprocal effects relating bully and depression factors. The results suggest that depression is a selection factor that leads to being a victim, but that being a victim has no effect on suppression on what can be explained by pre-existing depression suffered by these students. So our result is that having low self-concepts, low self-esteem, and high depression leads to being a victim. Uh, furthermore, being a victim exacerbates these problems in terms of low self-concept. Hence, that characteristics are risk and protective factors are different in that being a victim had surprisingly little effect on subsequent depression after controlling for outcomes. It also suggests that perhaps that these characteristics uh, are characteristics that bully choose, uh, use to choose victims, both depression and the low self-concept. The results have important implication for the design of interventions. <coughs> now, do bullies use bullying behaviors as a strategy to enhance self-concept or reduce depression? Our results suggest that there's no benefits to being a bully in terms of increased levels of self-concept or lower levels of depression. However, even if the use of bullying for this purpose is not a successful strategy, it is possible that it remains a motivation for students to become bullies. It's important for students, teachers, and administrators, and parents to reinforce the unacceptability of bullying behaviors so that students cannot delude themselves into thinking that such so socially inappropriate behaviors can result in enhanced social status and self uh, and positive self-perceptions, real or imagined. All right, let me now give you a brief overview of the intervention aspect of the study. We'll start by describing the multifaceted intervention program and then look at the experimental design and then present some of the results. So uh, the intervention is a whole school uh, approach, so we're looking at changing the ethos, 
uh, skilling teachers to treat bullying behaviors as they would any other inappropriate behavior, educating students about bullying and its consequences and how it differs from similar constructs like teasing, <coughs> and the importance of in parental involvement. Uh, we reason that all of these are important components to be included in an effective intervention. We know that bullying is complex, uh, based in part on individual student characteristics, but also on effects of the peer group, teacher characteristics, school climate, and so forth. With this in mind, we developed a multifaceted intervention called Beyond Bullying Secondary School Program. The key aspects of this intervention are the creation of a whole school policy to guide and direct the establishment of a whole school climate which does not include bullying. So key features of this policy are uh, concentrating the expertise of the school through a, a, a consulting team that works with us that's made up of uh, three or four or more teachers from the school, training the consultancy team in an out-of-school workshop, a three day workshop. Uh, all teaching staff in the schools were then presented with specific multi-purpose prevention and intervention strategies, uh, included strategies to enhance self-concept and pro-social peer relations. Uh, the starting point was the whole school intervention was to establish a proactive whole school policy. And here are some of the components that we had in this policy, including informing uh, parents about the school policy and trying to foster their involvement and support. Uh, the intervention involves uh, professional quality resource materials that we developed for teachers, students, and parents. A key was this uh, consultative team uh, of teachers that were responsible for uh, doing the training of teachers and uh, carrying out the intervention in the schools. In the workshop training, the consultative teachers were given training on detailed set of tasks that uh, they would undertake when they returned to their schools. And here's some of the things that were done in the, uh, the workshop. Uh, as part of the training program, the uh, consultative team was uh, given preventive strategies for enhancing peer relations and intervene intervention strategies for managing peer relations. The uh, different strategies were aimed at different levels of students, those who were bullies and victims, as well as those who uh, were not either bullies or victims. Some of the uh, micro micro technique strategies for teachers to manage bullies included some of the things that uh, we've listed here and these were presented as part of the uh, training of the teachers. Now let's take a look at the actual result, the experimental design and the results. The intervention was a, a multi-cohort, multi-occasion, quasi-experimental design with uh, six experimental schools. This intervention design allows us to uh, look at both cross-sectional and longitudinal comparisons. The, uh, the questionnaire uh, packages were administered to all students on six occasions over two years. The three uh, data collections in year one, time one, two, and three, were prior to the intervention and established a baseline control. During the intervention year, year two, there were three parallel data collections, times four, five, and six. The 10-week intervention was uh, administered uh, between time four and five. Five was the immediate uh, post-intervention. Six was a three-month uh, follow-up. Furthermore, the same experimental design uh, was replicated for each year group, each year in school. In this multi-cohort design, results for each year group during the experimental year could be compared to the group of students in the same year group from the previous year, the baseline year, but uh, a multiple cohort comparison. The results could also uh, be compared with the same group at time one, a multiple comparison. So uh, the year eight intervention group could be compared with results when the year before where they were in year seven, but they could also be compared with the year eight students from the year before when they were the intervention. The follow-up uh, period uh, test for stability and intervention and perhaps sleeper effects. <coughs> 
When there's not an intervention, that is the baseline year, there is dramatic increases in bully and victim scores over the course of the year. Bully increases between the start and middle of the school year and continues to increase during the rest of the school year. Victimization uh, increases from the start to middle and then levels off. These results were consistent, reasonably consistent across the six different schools. It is in relation to this baseline control that we compare the effects of the intervention. These results also show why a simple pretest, post-test comparison is relatively meaningless or even worse misleading. We begin with looking at bullying scores. Uh, the uh, the red line is uh, the baseline year that we just looked at. Uh, the, the blue is the experimental condition for the intervention year. Uh, overall rates of bullying in the intervention uh, condition were cons significantly reduced compared to the control condition. The effect size was about 0.16 standard deviations lower than the control group. The effects in relation to bullying uh, are preventative in, uh, in that as well as reducing rates of bullying, the program prevented the rates from increasing uh, as they had done in the control year. After completion of the intervention, there was also a significant sleeper effect in that bullies' uh, scores declined further during the follow-up period after the intervention. And this is quite unusual in uh, most educational and psychological research. Usually the intervention is most effective at uh, the end of the intervention. And uh, so the fact that we got a sleeper effect here was quite important. Furthermore, the intervention was equally effective across years and for males and female students. Uh, on average, the intervention also lowered levels of victim scores, however, not as much as uh, was seen with uh, the, the bullying scores. Wait a minute, let me jump ahead. Uh, the intervention was more effective in reducing verbal uh, victim scores among girls. The intervention didn't interact uh, with sex effects for the social and physical scales. Here we have uh, participant roles, passive reinforcers. For participant roles, the largest effect was reducing passive reinforcement, the so-called innocent bystanders who implicitly reinforce the bullying behavior. This was very consistent with our rationale for a whole school approach and suggests that the intervention was successful in changing the uh, school ethos. The intervention also had positive uh, effects on attitudes toward bullies and improved positive attitudes toward victims. Again, this is consistent with the rationale of a whole school approach. It suggests that the intervention was successful in changing the school ethos. So key components of the intervention were enhancing teachers' capacity to detect and respond to bullying behaviors, uh, and uh, this produced significant reductions in bullying and being bullied. Uh, also, the intervention highlights the merits of enhancing the school's own capacity to deal with bullying as opposed to having to rely on external agents to guide uh, their change process. The schools were willing to implement and benefit uh, from highly structured interventions that included developed materials with, uh, li uh, with little requirement to adapt them. The schools were able to use and adapt the uh, school policy that was, uh, that was the general one that we had. So summarizing, I've tried to outline three main components of the study. Uh, First of all, we uh, was the focus on psychometrically reliable and valid measures were achieved. This was an important contribution as measurement in this area is notoriously weak, still is very weak. Good measurement was critical in all aspects of the research. Once we had good measures, new insights were gained about the nature of bullies, uh, bullies and victims. We also learned how these constructs are related to a whole variety of psychosocial and well-being measures that are both protective and risk factors. In particular, we showed that bullying and being bullied are reciprocally related and that bullies and victims are more alike each other than they are different. Based on our insights, we developed the uh, Beyond Bullying program. 
the strong intervention, good measures, and sophisticated methodology demonstrated that uh, beyond bullying was a, an effective intervention. Okay, so where do we go? Where do we go from here, and what are new directions? Well, uh, subsequent to this research was the extension of the study to primary schools, and that was Linda Finger's uh, PhD thesis that some of you are aware of. Uh, more recently, we've had uh, a major focus on cyberbullying, and that's the sort of the basis of uh, of the of a grant proposal that's currently in review now. Uh, uh, we had the question, do bullies and victims become terrorists? Uh, uh, and some of the work that Lazar's uh, doing uh, may be related to that. Uh, we, we want to have a greater focus on risk and protective factors. Uh, what, are, what are risk and protective factors? Ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, disadvantage, agencies, self-belief, sense of belonging, extracurricular activities at schools. I think my belief is that uh, bullies uh, target victims that are vulnerable and that are different and aren't good at standing up for themselves. And so that has some important implications for, uh, for how we intervene. Uh, in the current uh, application that's being looked at, the, uh, we incorporate uh, social determination theory into the intervention design and evaluation to a much greater extent than we did in previous research. Also uh, in this new study that's under review now is a replication and extension to a true random control design in which we have a sufficient number of schools uh, to randomly assign at the school level. So one of the problems with uh, the earlier study was although we had a really sexy, uh, sophisticated experimental design, it was still quasi-experimental. It wasn't a true random assignment. And that's a big problem in this uh, area of research. It's surprisingly, given how much research that there's being done in the bullying area, there's almost no random controlled trials. And uh, in the systematic review that's published in the Cochrane Review, so it's published, you know, it's a top uh, 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 systematic review, uh, they claim that they knew what worked for bully interventions. But in fact, if you looked at the interventions, uh, the vast majority of them were uh, not random control trials. And uh, I think that they w were able to identify a relatively small number of, uh, of studies that had random control trials, and none of them uh, and on average, even across all of them, and from a meta-analysis perspective, were not had no significant effect or very little significant effect. And so, there's a lot of problems uh, in the research in this area, and it's actually quite it was quite surprising to us how poor the research was. The measurement was poor. The uh, experimental design was almost non-existent, and the methodology is pretty weak. So it's an exciting area, and we're very hopeful that we're going to uh, get continued uh, support from the Australian Research Council to pursue this research. But why don't I now turn it over, and we'll talk about some questions. Thank you.